how he applies them to the Highland Broadsword, and we will also look at how they apply to other weapons. Um, in the first class, we'll be doing a little bit of longsword, and in the second class, we'll be doing a little bit of what is Scottish transitional small sword, for which a rapier will do as an adequate stand-in, or a broadsword will do as an adequate stand-in for today's purposes. So we're going to start by looking at Page's Principle the Third, which states, the utmost force and strength of a man is exerted in straight lines and at right angles, and thus every throw is made perpendicular to the part aimed at. So, what does that mean? So, before I show you, I'm going to first of all say that this whole concept and way of analysing mechanics and the language that I'll be using, uh, we actually got many years ago now from Guy Windsor. So if you want to know more about this, go to Guy's mechanics class and you will learn a lot more about what we're about to do. Okay? But when people talk about imparting or receiving force, they say that you know, they have their energy directed somewhere or they're structured or directed in some direction. And the terminology that we use for this, which I, I really like because it gives you a good picture of what's going on, is to call it a ground path. So, a physical path through which you are grounded. So, if I could have a volunteer from the audience. There we are. Could you please stand as if you want to push a wall over with your fist? Push a wall over with your fist, like, like that. Excellent. So, without using any muscles, I'm just going to put some gentle pressure on you. And all the energy that I'm imparting is going through my friend's skeletomuscular structure into the ground through the rear foot. Yes? Hi. <laughs> okay? Now, you can all do this. Yes? So, this is a really, really full class, unfortunately, being dark and all that. So, I want you to find a partner and take turns doing this. Now, the thing I want you to be really careful about is that you are not using your muscles to push back. Okay? Big, strong guys can hold pretty well anybody up just through sheer, sheer, sheer muscular power. We don't want you to use your muscles. We want you to feel the force flowing through your structure into the ground through that rear foot. Yes? So, everybody find a partner. Have a go at just forming that ground path and feeling gentle pressure back. You may take a few little bits of adjustment to get it absolutely perfectly right. Okay? Again. Easy, right? So we can all stand in a fully strong, grounded position. So that is what we call a ground path. In Page's terms, that's a straight line. Now, what's important about that is that there are lots and lots of ways that you can fuck it up. Okay? So another different volunteer from the audience. Yeah, come right here. Okay, so one of the ones that bugs me personally, because you see it a lot in free fencing, is if you were to form your ground path, because you fist out, so that's it. But you're a little bit short on me, so I want you to reach for me by leaning forward and pulling that rear heel off the ground. Like this. Okay, so reach, really reach for me. That's it. Okay? People do this all the time with swords in the hand, and they say, ah, I hit you, yes? So just relax. No, no, stay there, stay with your grandpa. But if I put gentle pressure on, what happens? You immediately lose grounding. Yes, well, you have lost your grounding. If you take this foot off the ground, can the energy get into the ground anymore? No. So where does it go? Back. It go, well, it goes into you. Your structure collapses. Okay? So hitting somebody with the sword and going, I hit you, not really. I've got some percussive power from the speed of the sword, but I can't impart any force into my target if my foot is off the ground. Now, this is very different to that, which you will do more of in Guy's class. So you can ground yourself through the ball of your foot as well as through the heel. Very different. But leaning forward and say, I'm hitting you, I'm not. Am I imparting any force into you at all? Not really, no. Okay? Am I imparting any force into you now? I can sort of feel it from the heel, but that's yeah. not from here, that's from the foot. Yeah, okay, so I've turned the sword sideways, no. ground myself. See the difference? Okay, so another way in which you can fuck your ground path up, which is also very important, form your path again, 
and now I want you to bend your elbow a little bit. That's it. What happened? No support. No support again, okay? Extended structure, straight path. That breaks the structure at that point, okay? So I want, this is really important for Steve's class, silver, true times, hands before feet. This has a mechanical aspect as well as a tactical aspect. Hitting somebody with a sword. You don't mind me hitting you, do you? With a bent arm, can I impart any force to you? No. Hitting you with a straight arm. Yep. Feel the difference? Yep. So the hand before the feet, producing this straight arm at the point of impact, is not just tactical, not just for your own safety, it is mechanical as well. So I'm going to get you just to experience those two things for yourselves. So you're going to form your ground path, you're going to do two things. One, stand a little further away and lean forward and get them to push. Come on, yeah, that's it. And bend your elbow a little bit and feel the difference between a straight arm and a bent arm. You can push down. That's it. Okay, a couple of minutes, just do that for yourselves and feel how easily it is that you can lose your grounding by overreaching or breaking your structure. Okay, so we have a ground path. When I say ground path, you all know what I mean. Second basic concept, which again, you all know this, so even though sometimes you use different languages. If I can get another volunteer from the audience. Steve, all right. So face me with your ground path. Now, Steve is structured so to receive any force that I deliver in this line, yes? But is he structured to receive force in that line? Not right. No, not? Stand back, yeah. How about in that line? Okay, so he's only got two legs. So he can only support force in certain planes. And the two planes which he is most vulnerable are what we call triangle points, in which there is one there and there is one there, yes? Let me quote from Page again. The utmost force and strength of a man is exerted in straight lines and at right angles, and thus every throw is made perpendicular to the part aimed at. Do we get that now? What Page is saying in, in mechanical terms that we are using now is that your blows are ground paths directed at your opponent's triangle points. That's essentially it. Henry Angelo, another Highland Broadsword Master, wrote that the art of defence does not, in fact, so much consist in your own strength of position as in effecting a decidedly quick movement in the direction where your opponent has the least means of resistance. So he's saying more or less the same thing. And we're going to look at how that works with a broadsword now. And we're going to do it nice and easy. So somebody with a sword in hand. So first of all, I'm going to teach you the first of Page's two stances. It is called the wide stance or broad stance, where if Steve and I are, let's use this line here, this is the line of defence, okay? If we are standing, heels in line, toes pointing at each other in a fairly conventional stance, this is called the narrow stance. We'll use this in a minute. The other stance is the wide stance, where we stand astride the line of defence like this. So square on, not completely, not usually, not unless you're in St George, this foot is still forward, but only a little bit. I've still got my 90 degree angle, but this foot is 45 degrees that way, this foot is 45 degrees that way, and I am now square on to my opponent. So, on this stance, I'm gonna take what is called an outside guard, where the sword closes your outside line like so. Okay, now, if we are both in this stance, where is Steve mechanically most vulnerable? Sorry? In which, in which if, a, if it's a direct thrust, say, which line should, is he most vulnerable? <coughs> yeah, straight ahead, basically. His triangle point is right there, I can see it between his legs. Okay? So my attack should be delivered like so. And if I just do this gently, I'm striking him where he's mechanically most vulnerable. Yes? Do you have a mask handy? So this is where you're going to put your masks on and hit each other as hard as you feel comfortable. And you're going to experience this for yourself. Okay? So Steve 
can parry this by turning to an inside guard, like so, okay? But because of the mechanics, that is not a particularly strong parry. Can you feel that? Yep. Okay, stand in a narrow stance, make the same parry against the same attack. How's that? Good yes. Okay, so we're gonna experience this for ourselves. You're gonna stand in a wide stance, sword and outside guard. Just in Paige's terms, this is tend to held fairly close into the body and not in an English extended type way. Okay, I'm gonna get you to do a couple of blows circling the sword above your head to the inside and stepping in like so. Now notice that I'm going from a wide stance to a narrow stance. Where am I lining up? Yes, but also, you see I'm, I've gone across the center line here. Can we see this? Okay, so I'm not going here. Yes. Okay, I'm actually stepping forward and a little bit to the left. So it's there. <laughs> okay, so I want you to experience this for yourself. Feel the difference between standing narrow and receiving this cut and standing wide and receiving the same cut. Yes? Okay, off you go. Masks on. So, standing here and being hit straight down the middle, is that a good idea? <laughs> okay, as opposed to standing here. Yes? Which is stronger? That one, obviously. Okay, so, why would you ever stand like this? No. All right. So you guys are now going to, I normally do this as a test, but since we've got buckets of people, okay? If Steve steps straight at me and I step back with this foot, what's happened? Yeah. What happens if he attacks me and I step back with the other foot? <laughs> Whichever foot I step back in, I am not only then structured in a much better line. I'm also offline of where I started, okay? So one of the cool things about standing in this wide, broad stance is it doesn't matter which step I go, I'm going to be offline of where he's attacking and in a better position. See that? So this is not a stupid way to stand. We'll be doing a lot more of this when we do actual page technique type stuff but I wanted to show you that there's a reason why somebody might stand like this. Okay, so if Steve is in a wide stance, my primary attack should be aimed at his rear triangle point. And if his parry is a little bit crappy, that could easily blow through it and collapse it. Okay, but what happens if he's in a narrow stance? Okay, when we're in a narrow stance, we tend to be on the inside guard here, okay? so. Steve is now structured and in the guard against the direct attack. So if I attack him straight ahead, am I attacking him in a place where he is mechanically weak and vulnerable? Yeah. No. So we have two solutions to this. The first one is the page solution. Actually, the three, I lied. Okay, the page solution is intend, instead to attack, directing my force at this triangle point here. And I do this, by stepping around, <laughs> like so. My force is quite literally, I'm literally aiming my sword there. Okay, the footwork is what Paige causes, calls a traverse. So it's actually a big left foot step. It's not a pass, it is much more of a hook. So it's a big left foot hook. And it really is, it's just like giving a great big left hook into the side of his head, I'm just doing it with the sword in my right hand. So I make a great big circle, and I go boom. And the blow is literally aimed like so, okay? So, next exercise, you're gonna experience that for yourselves. Inside guard to inside guard, narrow stance, 
this time taking our left leg in a great big left hooky motion like so, circling the sword around and delivering this blow. And if Steve doesn't have his sword in the way, this is quite literally aimed to hit him as far around the back of your head as I can and aimed out there. So you might want to do a couple of slow ones without the parry, just to feel the forces involved. Like so. Feel where that force is being directed. And then you can try and turn your hand for a couple of parries. Okay, so off you go. Cut two, narrow stance to narrow stance. This time, on a big left foot. Okay, volunteer from the audience, somebody? Okay. So if we just look at what we just did without the swords, without the levers, when we are square on, our attack is that. When we are narrow on, so narrow space, okay, put your sword up in the, a sword-like thing, your attack is that. Those are the two lines of force that you are attacking with your sword. All clear on that? Happy with that? Okay. So, that's the way Paige does it. Okay? The attacks are th that way, then that way, then that way, then that way, around in this traversing step. Okay? It's not the only solution. And this is where we'll pick up something medieval, like a long sword. Okay? Somebody else got a long sword? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so we'll both just... Ah, oh, somebody with a mask, even better. <laughs> Excellent. Right, so I'm going to get you to stand in something like this. So just to make it nice and easy that everyone can see. Now, I'm just going to get you to lift up into a simple parry. If I attack directly ahead, am I attacking in a direction where my opponent is mechanically vulnerable? No, it doesn't matter how hard. I try and push through my ground path, I'm not going to get through that. Okay? Who's going to win from here? Yeah, may, he probably will at that point. Okay? Maybe, maybe if it's there, maybe I might, but it certainly it's a 50-50 roll at best. Okay? If he steps that way when I do this attack directly ahead, who's in a better position now? If he steps that way when I make the attack directly ahead, who's in a better position now? So if you make a direct attack straight ahead, the best that you can hope for, mechanically speaking, is a 50-50 chance of have maybe having an advantage. And if he moves anywhere, he's going to be better off, yes? So should you ever attack straight ahead? Not, yes. Oh, there might be the occasional tactical opening. But as a general rule, as an opening gambit, it's a really bad idea. Dobringer, even though, generally speaking, I'm not fond of German longsword forces, but Dobringer says, Lichtenau also means that you should not step straight in with the blows, but from the side at an angle, so you come in from the side where you can reach him easier than from the front. Strikes or thrusts are to the man, to the openings, to the head and the body, with steps and leaps in from the side. Of course, he's not alone in that. Silva talks about the continual motion traversing of his ground circular wise forwards backwards upon the right side and the left side. Okay? All of which means that you are much better off not attacking straight ahead but coming in from one side or the other. So in this particular meeting of stances I do not want to attack straight ahead, I want to go here. Where am I aiming? The triangle point, thank you. That way. So again, even if my opponent gets his sword up, there's a fairly good chance of me either blowing through it or being in such a strong mechanical advantage. Now look at the leverage here. He's got forte on foible, yes? And yet, who's feeling stronger? Do you feel like you can take your sword away and do anything to me? No. No, whereas I, can do that at any time I like. Okay? So the attack here, don't do anything, is this. Let's look at the footwork. We call this triangle step, okay? And it is a two-part step. 
The first step is a pass lateral. Okay? Notice that this foot is basically stepping in the direction it's already facing. What I don't want to do is hook this foot around too early like that. Can anybody tell me why that's bad? What? Not, not just hold that thought, that very clever person. Look at my knee. Yes, my, well, it's certainly going to hurt. Does my knee bend in that direction? Not unless something's gone horribly wrong. Okay? So I don't want to land with my body weight traveling in this direction with my foot facing that way. So it's really important for your own knee longevity that you land like so. Once you roll up onto the ball of your foot, then you turn and make your corrective step. Okay? That, with practice, becomes so smooth and fast you can't see it anymore. Okay? But it is an important point that if you're going to make a big lateral step that way, this foot lands like that, and then you make your corrective step. The blow should land with the first foot, so don't move for me, form, and then the follow through happens with that foot there. Okay? For now, we're not going to be doing blows with the aim of following through. We're going to be doing blows with the aim of feeling the lines of force. So you can arrest your blow on your opponent, make a corrective step, and feel if you are pointing in that direction there. Yes? Okay, so important thing to make this work is that the attacker is left foot forward, the defender is right foot forward. We'll swap that round in a minute. So just a couple of reps each. Again, this is pretty basic stuff, but I want you to feel making that step out to the side, pointing at their triangle point. All right, so just a note on that. Okay, when you're doing your triangle steps and you're making this corrective step, this heel can go no further round than heels in line. It is very tempting to do that, okay? That is no good. It breaks your, breaks your grounding. And it also, so at this stage, let's just have a look at this triangle step. This is getting into long sorty stuff. But here, don't move, out of distance, perfectly safe. In distance, but that means I'm in distance of him, yes? So I'm safe for the moment because I'm hitting him, okay? But I'm not going to be safe for very long. As I bring this heel back into line, I'm out of distance again. Can we see that? Okay. What happens if I overcorrect? I get back into distance. Okay. So it has tactical as well as mechanical reasons not to do that, unless you intend to. If you're doing Italian rapier, you may intend to, but we're not. Okay. So I'm going to get you to match my stance this time. Okay. So up, up on the right shoulder. That kind of thing. Okay, so here, I'm going to do mechanically exactly the same thing. Don't do boom, boom. Okay? This time, my force is again going at his forward triangle point rather than his rear one. And it's, this gives you just a little clue at how simplified these concepts are. Because in reality, this cut has a pushing force as I land. It has a pulling force as I cut through. It has a spiraling force as I make my corrective step. It's a very, very three-dimensional thing, okay? Cuts exert forces in a kind of complicated, three-dimensional, screwy kind of way, okay? So we are simplifying things a lot. But nonetheless, the simple take-home Newtonian physics thing that actually works well enough is to think of as I'm forming my ground trough at his triangle point. You could feel that? No, no, no. <laughs> so we're going to do the same attack this time. We're both going to be in match stances, up on the right shoulder, however it is you feel like you want to do it. It doesn't matter. Do a couple of them nice and slowly. Place that nice and gently on the back of his neck so you can feel that force going down to there, and then you can get him to stick his sword in the way a couple of times. Which may or may not make any difference. Okay? So, we're stepping offline again, doing exactly the same thing against somebody in the opposite stance. 
or in the, to what we just did, the match stance. Off you go. Right. <laughs> so if my opponent is kind enough to present their triangle step for me, we'll just pretend they're broadswords, I make my attack directly ahead at their triangle point because that's going to be the hardest thing for them to parry or force them to move. If they're in a narrow stance, I've got a choice. I could go this way with either weapon, it doesn't matter. Or I could, if I'm sword foot back, go that way with either weapon, it doesn't matter. The principle is the same. You want to aim your attack, particularly an initial attack when you're first engaging somebody, you want to make it in a line where your opponent is mechanically most vulnerable, where they're gonna make the, have the hardest time doing a simple parry and or are gonna to have to move to make it effective. So now we're gonna look at some defense and you guys are gonna go away and figure something out for yourselves. You're both going to be outside guard, wide stance. The attack, don't move, is going to be this. Cut number one, inside cut, directed at the rear triangle point. Your job is to make an inside parry, that's easy. Just turn the wrist, okay? Nice, simple, really conservative little parry. And move one foot in a direction that gives you a mechanical advantage so that you retake the advantage, okay? So you've got two feet, left foot, right foot, you can move forward or backwards or sideways with either of them. So spend five minutes figuring out where should I move one of my feet to make that parry better. Clear enough? Off you go. Forward with which foot? Right, okay. So, Steve is gonna step forward with the right foot. Okay, so, his parry is now super strong, yes? And he's stopped my sword offline. It's now wide of the center line. That's good, because he's now got a nice big riposte to the side of my face, yes? If you'd like to do it again. It has a fatal flaw. <laughs> so mechanically, not bad, but tactically, yeah. Any other ideas? Back with the left. Okay, mechanically this is okay. He's now lined up at the point of contact, but does he have a superior position to me? Does he have a line of riposte? Not really, okay? The first person who uncrosses is gonna win that one. So, yeah, possibly better than the first one, but still not great. Any other ideas? Back with the right. Back with the right. Would you like to come and demonstrate? <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Lend him a sword. <laughs> yeah. So, there's the cut. Oh, okay, interesting, a kind of vaulty type thing. All right, so, where am I stepping when I make this step? Forward and left. So, so if that's a feint, what happens? You get pegged. Good idea though. Do you want to know the real solution? I still want sword. Sorry. <laughs> 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 all my gear's stuck in velvet. <laughs> yeah. All right, look. You're all very close. Let's have a look at what we should actually do. Yes. I make a slip. So you are kind of right. The right foot comes back, but it steps back behind the left, which brings me across the center line. So I get this lovely opening there. You'll also note that by going backwards, I get leverage, forte and foible. So it doesn't matter how strong that blow is, I'm gonna win this. I'm also out of distance, so if he swoops under at my leg, it's not there. Okay? So. I don't even want to finish the cut. <laughs> <laughs> so, the correct solution to doing that is that. The other thing I will just point out here, because I've seen a lot of people making big, punchy out parries, this is not the Highland way. Okay? If all I do, do, the, do your cut very slowly. If all I do is turn this, my wrist like this, is this gonna save me? No. If I do the slip, does it save me? Yes, the footwork is an integral part of the parrying because it means that your parries are made with what is called a trifling turn of the wrist. That, 
and that. And everything else is done by the feet. So that the hand movement is as minimal as possible, which means that your hand is uncommitted should it be a feint or something tricky. So we're gonna look at another version of it. Inside the guard to inside guard. So on the arrow? Yes. Cut on the first, I'll just stand there and take it. Boom, okay. My defense to this one, I'll just show you for time's sake, is I do this. Where is my grand path now pointing? Straight towards his triangle point, right there. So my defense is made by going narrow stance to wide stance like that, only a little bit. But that gives me an enormous advantage in position. If I keep my parry nice and close, I also manage to get foible, which means that my riposte, I get to hit him with both swords at once. <laughs> So we're going to have a go at this one, again, just so you can see how just a tiny adjustment in your stance and your footwork can give you an enormous mechanical advantage in defence. So the attack is that second attack on the great big left foot traverse. The parry is made. Keep, stay there. We'll do this. Same. The parry is made. Off you go. I turn my hand just to an outside guard, just the wrist. I take my left foot no more than 8 or 12 inches to the left, and I should parry like this. To riposte, I then immediately turn my sword back towards the inside, and I basically just punch directly towards his triangle point. If you do it right, you'll drive his sword back into his head as well as your own. Okay? If you try and do this with an extended parry, you won't get a line of riposte at all. So let's have a go at that. Bore all this more deeply in the actual broadsword class. But... Hopefully you can see that sometimes presenting your, your triangle point to your opponent in defence is a bad thing and leads into all sorts of trouble, yes? Um, the other mechanical principle I just wanted to pull out there, or principles, doing the same cut, yep. is first of all leverage. Any time you can parry his foible with your forte is good because it gives you a massive mechanical advantage over the other person's sword. The other thing about that is that on my parry, where are my muscles? Coiled, contracted, ready to spring and punch out. A parry like this, okay, I can stop it, this is nice and strong, but my muscles are committed to this action. It's going to be slower, it's going to be slower. And like, I could do that, that's not going to hurt Steve, it's just going to annoy him. You don't want to annoy Steve. I've, I've seen him hit people after they've hit him like that without a mask on. Okay? <laughs> okay? But contracting on your parry allows you to expand on your riposte. Do the cut number one. Contracting on your parry allows you to expand on your riposte. So this concept of contraction and expansion, contraction and expansion, contraction and expansion is also an important biomechanical aspect of the system um, and common in a lot of English stuff. So we're now going to move finally on to our last little bit of this particular class, back to the long swords. Somebody over here made a very clever point earlier. Um, somebody with a long sword and mask. Right, little still, still will be better. All right, okay. Which is we're going to be both back in this one. Swap your feet round. That's the way. Okay. Somebody said that when I am here, I have a problem. Which is you remember what you said, whoever you were. Open your triangle point to me. Correct. Can we see this? So if I step straight at me, I'm going to fall over. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to get you to do exactly the same thing. Ooh, what happened? Well, you got a sword in your face, didn't you? Okay, wait for me to get there and then push in. Push in again. Try and push in another way. Yeah, push, 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 push. Thank you. What's the difference between the first time when you can push me over and the second time? What did I do? 
didn't move quite as far. But no. Anybody? Yes. I forward weighted. Okay. Here, my triangle point is where? Center of your body. Where is my triangle point now? It, yeah, it's basically there. Which means that if I make this attack, my sword and my leg are now hiding my triangle point from my opponent. Doesn't matter how hard and how fast he pushes in on me, he's going to go one way or the other. Um, when I did this class in Chicago a couple of years ago, one of the students came up with a really, really good analogy, which I'm going to steal, which it says, your sword is like a rock in the stream. Okay? It divides your opponent's force. He must either go to the left or the right of this. If he goes that way, that happens. Oh, well, that was terrible. At least get your sword in the way. If he goes the other way, that sort of thing happens. Go this side again. Okay, I can do things like that. I can even swivel if necessary. But I'm hiding my only mechanical vulnerability simply by shifting my weight forward ever so slightly. So this is the last bit of this particular class before we move on to what the shouldery stuff. Okay, but this is really cool. And so I want you guys to experience this. So here's going to be the drill, both up and right shoulder. The attacker does this and stands there even weighted while the defender swings straight at you. And you will feel that sort of thing happen. Then you're going to do exactly the same thing, but you're going to be forward weighted, about 70, 70 30 say. They're going to run at you. Just deal with whatever they do, but feel that you can deal with it, okay? If they go that side, just seed and hit them with the pommel and doing other Fiori type stuff. If they go this way, let's try and push through that shoulder, say. I could do something like that, okay? Notice I didn't decide to do that. I just responded to his pressure, okay? Being forward weighted like this means that if he pushes there, that's going to happen. I don't need to think about it. I don't need to decide it. I just need to flow with it. So that's our last exercise for this first half of the class. Attack even weighted, get pushed over. Attack forward weighted, don't get pushed over. Okay? Off we go. But that all relates to just one of Page's mechanical principles. Okay, straight lines and right angles, ground paths and triangle points. Okay, um, and we'll explore that more in broadsword and longsword classes later in the weekend. Whoops, crash bang. Okay, so we're now going to move on to the second half, which relates only to single sword. Okay, um, it's called The Power of the Shoulders, and this is a quote from The Truth of the Sword by the Marquis of Newcastle which is apparently tomorrow night's dinner entertainment. I'll be doing a PowerPointy thing. But what Newcastle says, he says, but that which is the main business is the power of the sword, which belongs to the shoulders, and those shoulders absolutely belonging either to the inside or outside of the sword, and this is your true strength and power. For this power rightly known and used is the quintessence of the play. Then you must understand that the right shoulder masters the inside of the sword and belongs only to it, and the left shoulder to the outside of the sword and belongs only to it and will master their own sides. So this is Newcastle's explanation of the principle that Page calls equilibrio. This is Page's principle the first, which reads, while his right hand is varying the centre of gravity every moment by continually throwing from side to side and guarding every part successively, the left is its counterbalance, and by moving diametrically opposite, preserves the centre of gravity in the centre of magnitude, and both still perpendicular over the standing foot. Clear on that? All right, so what the hell does that mean? We know two guards now. We know the outside guard, and we know the inside guard, yes? The left hand has something to do with these guards as well. When I am on the inside guard, 
I want to be slightly back weighted. Again, 70% off that front foot so I can slip it nice and easily. And I achieve that by using my left hand as a counterbalance. So if Steve can come in and be back at me, I throw that arm out there. And you can see if I just stand upright and I do that, that automatically pulls my head and my weight back. So my head is now six inches further away from the nasty pointy thing than it was. Yes? Okay, so this is a counterbalance and it's pulling me back. And a lot of sword systems use that, yes? When I'm in a wide stance, square on, I don't want my hand out the back because that's stupid. I bring it round in front of my tummy and I let it kind of hang over this left leg. So again, my weight is more on my left than it is on my right. So every time I go to an inside guard, my hand goes backwards. Every time I go to an outside guard, my hand goes forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Yes? That is the principle. So how does it work? Okay. It doesn't just work as a counterbalance, it also is a power generation system. If you can just stand there and I will do a cut number one in a Hutton-like way and you can do a parry. Fine. I shall now do cut number one in a page-like way using the left hand. That had nothing to do with this arm had to do with this arm. Did you see what I did? Yes. It goes that way. Which means I'm using my entire shoulder mechanism to deliver the cut and not just my right forearm. Okay? The other thing to note about this is it's, the, it's not just the starting and ending position of the hand. The path that the hand takes on that is also extremely important. If I throw this cut and I throw this arm out horizontally, can you see that, that that did to my cut? What did it do? Yeah, it pulled it flat. It is di moving diametrically opposite the left hand. If I do this vertically, brushing by there, that keeps the cut vertical, yes? Why is that important? Can anybody tell me? Yes, what would you say? Blade alignment? Well, I can align my blade sideways if I wanted to. Yes, okay. And that is Page's principle, the second. Two lines parallel to the line of defense and tangents to the surface of the combatant's bodies are the bounds of every throw and every guard. Nor can the sword be moved any distance beyond those two lines, but it must leave the body unguarded. And a guard held beyond either of those lines exposes the body in general without defending any particular part. All of which is Page's way of saying, keep your cuts within the width of your body. There, 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 there. Not there, there. Can we see the difference? This is not guarding any particular part and it's not aiming at a lot of Steve, only the bits in the middle. This aims at all of Steve, and at every part of that throw, it, it is protecting me, because it is passing from one guard to another. So we want to keep our cuts nice and steep, width of the body, temple to thigh. Yes, although we'll, you don't tend to strike as a defense. So we're going to have a go at practicing cut number one, in the following manner, outside guard to outside guard. This, we're going to make a circle with the tip of the sword. Lonergan says that the bigger the circle you make with the tip of the sword, the more powerful the blow. And being Highlanders, we want to, don't just want to scratch him, we want to cut him in half, so we're going to make a big circle. Okay? It can either be a great big circle above your head like that, as if we were deeply engaged and I need to bring my sword all the way around. I'm going to do that whether or not I'm engaged or not. Okay? Or, if you want, slightly more sophisticated, do it on a Moulinet. Okay? So I disengage like so. Okay? Whichever one you feel comfortable with. But you make the circle, and as the sword starts to come forward, you make your traverse forward and a little bit to the left, and you throw your left hand out behind you, 
no, no target needed, like so. And I finish in what? And? Close, ear, yeah, inside guard, the other guard. I finish in a guard. I cut from the outside guard to the inside guard. Okay, so let's have a go at that and get used to recruiting the left hand and the left shoulder into the delivery of the blow. Well, remember, we are moving from a wide stance to a narrow stance to the left. So I'm lining up here. So, Steve, what did Silver say about defending in true garden? Where did he say to move? When all your gatherings beat your enemy's right. Correct. Why? Because you, you choke his blood before it has entered into its full force. Correct. Okay? So I am not stepping, mask back on, here. Am I protected here? No, he can hit me. He can stop thrust me or stop cut me. Okay? That does me no good. I could do it if I did this. What's wrong with that? Well, I'm cutting ass, I'm violating principle the second. He could slam down on my sword, drive it to the ground, and hit me all at once. Okay? If I step to the left, I choke his blow up. I give him virtually no time to respond. Okay? I have now dominated this center line. Okay? I don't care about the line in the middle of his body. His sword isn't there. His sword is in his right hand. So, stick sword out. So if I can be here, I win. Because he hasn't got a direct line. He can go that way, or he can go all the way around, to the other side, and I'm going to win. So I want to dominate my opponent's right hand. I want to dominate his sword hand. So I am stepping forward and to the left. Clear enough? Yeah. And that way I can keep my blow nice and vertical and provide opposition for me as I make the attack. Okay, so be aware of that as you go. Watch the feet. So let's have a look at cut number two. I'm on an inside guard, my hand is out the back here. Now if I throw a cut in a Huttony type way and my opponent stands there and parries, that's about it. If I throw cut number two in a pagey type way, <laughs> again, power generation. It's not, we're using the mechanical triangle pointy type stuff that we we're doing before, but I'm also folding both my shoulders so everything is moving in the one direction. Can we see that? Okay, so it goes out and in and out and in. So you're recruiting your whole torso, your whole body into every cut, like so. And when you get good at this, it means that you can deliver extremely fast, powerful cuts with this arm basically staying there, just rolling it around the wrist because it's everything back here that's generating the power. And that's, that's basically Newcastle's point, the power of the shoulders. Okay, and we're using our left hand to manipulate our left shoulder. So let's have a go at cut number two, which you've all done, you all know it. But this time, we're going to bring that left hand around in front of your body. And again, you can make this an active part of the action. Bring that across really quite strongly to help generate power. What is this equilibrio stuff actually doing in terms of mechanics? Okay? We have a really, really simple way of explaining it. So if I can have a target dummy, a new person who's not done it before. So, come on. All right, so hang on to your sword. I'm gonna get you to do cut number four, or pitching to a hanging, which is starting from this guard, you finish in a hanging guard like that. I'm sure you can do that. So, okay, so do it on a lunge. There we are, so aim it at me. Doesn't matter, and just do it in a lunge. Yeah, front foot. Excellent, now stop there. Now, at the moment, don't move a muscle, stay in your head. Is your head covered from a counter attack? Mm. Yes, yes, that's fine, I can't hit you. Yeah. That's fine, so don't move. Do not move, freeze, freeze, freeze. I'm gonna remove the sword gently from your hand, just to keep it exactly where it is. If I now test your ground path, yeah. are you grounded? 
fairly. Where's your hand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, by moving the hand out of alignment with the shoulders upwards, like that, you break your ground path at that point. And I can do whatever I like with that, yes? So I want you to take the same hanging guardy position, but this time with a super strong ground path. Off you go. Yeah, yeah, so finish in the same position, as if you've done your lunge, I forget the wide thing. Okay, so that still, yep. even without the sword, just in that hand position, form a super strong ground path. Okay? Less muscles, more structure. See, that's good. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Now, hold the sword in the hanging guard in that position. Good. Now, that's a super strong position. Mm -hmm. Are you protected? So we have a dilemma here. I can either make this cut finishing in a position that the sword's in the way of things to my head, but it's actually so weak that a solid counter cut will probably blow it through. Or I can finish it where it's super strong, but not actually protecting me. How do we solve this? We use equilibrio. Take your super strong position. Take your left hand and reach down as if you want to tickle the back of your neck. Really reach down and bring that up. Now, now put your left hand in front of your tummy. Could we all see that? Okay. Equilio Bureau is the three-dimensional maintenance of the shoulders in alignment. Even into the mid-19th century, there's a 1857 cutlass manual does this. They're still teaching it right towards the end of the 19th century. Okay? And that is what equilibrio is. It is the use of the left hand to manipulate the left shoulder to maintain alignment with the right shoulder so the right shoulder can do stuff that single swords can do that two-handers can't, which is move in lots and lots and lots and lots of directions. Okay? Independent of the body. That is equilibrio. Now, for time reasons, I won't get you to practice that now. We can do that in a broadsword class later, but it's a really clear example of what it is that we are doing with this action. We are bringing this shoulder into alignment with this shoulder, no matter which cut I make, including and up to the infamous number three. Okay. Is this a strong position? Okay, it's weak and horrible and nasty, yes? You don't need to practice that to know that it's weak and horrible and nasty. Where is my hand travelling when I make this cut? Up and, up and left. So, if I want to use equilibrio to make it better, where should my right hand go? Down and right. Okay, see how far I'm reaching around? All the way around here. This one we're going to practice. Would you like to hold your sword up there as a sort of target thingy, just, just horizontally out, just so I can, I've got something to hit. So, number three, normally, oh come on, put some resistance into it. Yeah, okay, I got nothing. Horrible. Number three with equilibrio. Feel the difference? Okay, this is still not the nicest position in the world to be in, but it's a whole lot better than it was. So this one we're gonna practice. So, target dummies, just have your sword out like there as something to hit. Do a couple of number threes without doing anything particularly with the left hand. And then do that. Don't do this cut with your finger over the cross. Italian swords are not designed for this. This is a hammer fist sword technique. It is not something that you want to do with a Shea of Honor or a side sword. So, just sticking that finger makes an enormous difference in the mechanics, which is where we're going to go next. We're going to finish off looking very briefly at how equilibrio is applied to thrusting weapons, specifically the kind of transitional rapier -y small sword thing that Sir William Hope and Donald McBain were using. Okay? Um, this one has a flat blade because Hope says you don't want one of these stupid French triangular blades because they're brittle and they snap. You want a rapier with a good edge. Okay? But the weapon is basically it's a transitional rapier of more or less perfect length. Most important thing about this is how you grip it, okay? So for those of you who have rapiers, you can use a rapier for this part of the class, but
but don't grip it like a rapier, okay? McBain specifically warns against this, sticking the finger over the quill and don't do it because we're doing something that is not Italian rapier. Um, I'm going to actually demonstrate this with a long sword or somebody's got a long sword. Um, all right. So I'll need a, a, a volunteer from the audience again. Okay, so, no, no, you, you, with your sword, you don't need a mask on. Okay, form the ground path with your sword. Okay, so I'm just gonna put some pressure on that. Steady as a rock. Now, if this was a small sword, would it be pointing in the right direction? No. So I want you to now point it at me as if it's useful for a small sword. Okay, and I'm now going to test your ground path. And that's actually okay. Okay, did anybody see what happened? What did he do when he moved his... No, not the shoulders. Yes, that's it. Okay, hammer fist, ground path, fine. This, bad. So when we point a small sword at somebody, we're not sticking our finger over the cross in order to bring that point down as we do with a rapier. We are changing our grip. Specifically, we're extending our thumb along the handle of the thing, not entirely on top and not entirely on the side, right there. So we're pushing the point down and forward and we're pulling in quite tightly with our last three fingers. And you'll notice that now I have the nice straight wrist and my hilt is ever so slightly higher, lower than my point. Yes? This is the way you have to hold a small sword. Okay, so if everyone can get whatever sword they're using, doesn't matter what it is, but I want you to take this small sword grip and then get your partner. So if you can do, do the grip for me, point, to, point it at me like a small sword. Okay, now that's broken the wrist a little bit, so get that wrist straight. There's nothing wrong with having the hilt slightly higher than point. And that really pushed that along there. And then just test your opponent's ground path. Yeah, yeah. It's just the extension of the thumb and the pulling in that. The important, bit, the important bit is to keep this wrist straight. You do not want to break your wrist by pointing it like that. You want your wrist to be dead straight. So everybody do that and then just get somebody to test that you're forming a nice grounded, strong thrusting position with your sword. It's basically a modified hammer grip, pulling in tight with these three fingers and extending the thumb this way. And that's what these little part of arms they're called, but the little vestibule rings that you see on small swords, that's what they're there for. There is a spacer for the thumb so it doesn't slam into the shell when you thrust at things. Okay, it's not there for sticking your finger through. And the pommel should be pulled nice and tight into the fold of the palm like that. Because this is a pussy little sword. There's not a lot to it. So if I want to drive it into something like Steve, <laughs> who's full of gristle and muscle and bones and things, I need to form a super strong structure with which to drive my pissy little point in with. Yes? Okay. So if you would like to, you've got something on under that, don't you? Uh, Who's got oh, uh, Nobody's yeah. wearing anything. You, you've got a gambeson on. <laughs> You'll do. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> small sword thrust is extend into your maximum position of maximum grounded strength and using a lunge, which is really a push, push your point through your opponent like that. That's it, okay? Extend, form this super strong structure and push, form. Now, if you're pointing your sword at me, okay, so just, just that'll do. And I do this, <coughs> am I safe? No, what do I want to do when I make a thrust? Close the line, exactly, form opposition. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to, you're attacking me this time, so I'll get you to form opposition as you do your thrust, like, so just, just form opposition as if you're gonna do it. Okay, stop, brilliant. Don't move, I'm gonna remove the sword from your hand, keep your hand exactly where it is. And now I'm gonna do, test your ground path. Ooh, that's a bit wonky, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Yes, because you did that. Everybody, this is your next exercise. You're gonna form a ground path, test it, then turn your hand to a full cart, test it again. 
turn it to a full second, test it again. And you will find that a straight third is nice and strong, a full fourth is pretty crappy, a full second is slightly less crappy but still pretty crappy. Feel this, okay? That and that unlock your arm and break your ground half. That's super strong. So we're all convinced this is, I try all convinced that a straight third like this and hammer fist is actually pretty strong. Turning it all the way to there and all the way to there is not so. McBain says specifically, don't do either of those things. Never turn that beyond 45 degrees and your outside, your turf should be more or less straight. So how can we form opposition with our small sword if we can't turn our wrist? No. Nope. If I want to close the inside line, okay, so we, we say do the Pulp Fiction. Okay, because that turns my torso. Turns my shoulders, turns my torso, and closes the inside line. Okay, this has not changed at all. This is still the same dead straight, super strong structure I had before, but by doing this, I close my inside line and my hand hasn't moved. Okay, that's important because in the small sword, what's, what's a basic attacking technique that's still taught first foil lesson to this very day? Okay, Steve, sorry if you, if I was standing here and you wanted to hit me, how would, what would you do to draw me out of position? And then, the one, two, yes, okay, so he goes, one, whoop, and if I've committed this hand to that parry, I'm not going to get back for the second parry. If, however, I do that, I haven't moved my hand. I've closed the inside line. <laughs> okay, so we're going to practice doing the first thrust from McBain. We're going to be in something equivalent to an outside guard, terse and McBain's terminology is basically the same. Straight wrist, nice firm structure. And I'm going to disengage, turn up to here, and deliver my thrust. Note that my hilt is still lower than my point. Okay? I'm coming in hilt to hilt. I'm not trying to control the foible or any of this stuff. What I'm trying to do is seize the center line with the strongest possible structure. So even if Steve attempts to parry this, I'm gonna win. So that's the first of two thrusts we're gonna learn. Let's have a go at that. And remember, it's not about your hand, it is about your left shoulder. Do the Pulp Fiction and turn the torso. Very, very, very long way past beer o'clock, so let's look at the second thrust. Okay, I'll get you around this side. If we're already on an inside or a cart, okay, now stop everybody. Steve, don't move, because Steve has done something wrong. Steve has gone French. <laughs> McBain doesn't like the French. Hope really doesn't like the French. Okay, and this is what happens if somebody goes French on you. You go. Because by turning it to a full cart, what's he done? Yes, okay. Now with something super, super light, like a epee bladey weight, late period, late 18th century fort, small sword, doesn't matter. With one of these, which is a shade under a kilo, seven or 800 grams, um, the real ones are, I've handled a couple of real ones, um, they are not in substantial weapons. And you don't want somebody binding them out of the way, okay? Gordon says of this particular technique, The French have not yet noticed this. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, that's technique number one against Frenchmen, okay? But if, so pull that elbow up, that's the way, okay? So now I can't attack on the inside, I'm engaged there, so I'm gonna to go to the other side. So I'm basically gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna disengage and do this, and then deliver my thrust. The other thing to note about this, so you, you can see this is the equivalent of that with a cut. I'm doing the same thing. And I'm simply folding it down to there. 
and allowing that to turn my torso and thus my sword. The other thing to note about these is that when I'm on the inside, where's my hand? Yeah, so it's between the nasty man's sword and me. So I can use it for a hand parry if I need to. When I go to this side, where's my hand? Yes. So in both cases, they're protecting the face. And notice then, Steve turned his sword, he's got plenty of leverage, and he still didn't stop the thrust. Because I've got this super strong structure that I'm stepping in behind. So we're gonna do thrust number two. So this time we're gonna start engaged on the inside. Okay, McBain tends to assume an engagement. Disengage, turn to there, extend, and deliver your super strong thrust, keeping your hilt lower than your point and your wrist dead straight. Off we go, thrust number two. Two primary thrusts in Scottish small sword. Sir William Hope says, this strong and manly method of thrusting <laughs> not only penetrates the quick, but even to the noble and inward parts, whereas upon another time is in a matter only superficial and scurfing, that is, more proper for diversion in an assault than for obtaining just satisfaction in the field. Thrusts commonly delivered are so feeble and weak that they are many times scarcely capable of piercing to the ribs, far less through them or to the cartilage of the breast. So Hope and McBain are both about killing people, okay, with a relatively feeble weapon. And Hope in particular argues that the French are only doing it for sport. Okay, so they, they can go, I touched you and I get a point. Whereas their thrusts in reality are not strong enough to actually penetrate people. Now, has anybody got an actual rapier rapier here? Excellent, would you like to come and be rapier person? No, 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 that's fine. Okay, so if I can borrow that just for a sec. So rapier people might be set feeling slightly freaky that that's really bad. And that's like a primary thing that you do with rapier, yes? So I'd like you to come here, form your ground path in third. Nice and strong. Form it in a full fourth. Total crap. Now, form it in a full fourth, but stick your finger out. What's happened? Yes. Stick your finger back in. Ah. This changes everything. As weird as it is, the Italian grip, sticking that finger extended and wrapping it over the quillen, rearranges everything that's going on behind the wrist. So suddenly that and that are super strong, that and that a bit crap, a bit uncomfortable. That, impossible. Those of you who attempted to do cut three like that, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the difference between small sword and rapier is largely in the grip. That's a rapier grip. That means that is one of my strongest positions and gives me, sorry, you use that, stick your sword at me. Okay. This allows me to get right up here on the foible and control it all the way in, yes? Okay, which you can't do with a small sword because they will just bind it out of the way. Okay. So the way that you grip the sword affects the whole mechanics of the arm which affects the best way of using the sword. And that's really all I've got to say about rapiers, silly things as they are, <laughs> that they are not this. But the basic mechanical principles behind them, the ground path and all that sort of stuff is gonna be the same. It's just gonna be applied in a different way because it's a different grip on a different weapon. So I just wanted to point that out so that the rapier people didn't feel all freaky. Ah, and we are done for the night. And I, I for one need a beer. So. Yes, questions, questions. As part of my ignorance, what is that particular type of weapon? Okay, um, in Hope's day, so we're talking 1680s to 17, early 1700s, rapier and small sword were used largely interchangeably. Yeah. You did get flat blades and you did get triangular blades. And there is some evidence that people tend to refer to flat ones as rapiers and triangular ones as small swords, but that's not universal. Sometimes you get the same weapon being referred to as both in the same manual. 
okay? But it's basically, it's, a, it's, it's shorter than a Renaissance rapier, it's got a tiny little shell hilt, um, and it's something well under a kilo in weight. And Yes, yeah, yeah, it tended to be shorter. So, yeah. Yeah, so rapiers tend to be, especially Renaissance rapiers, stupidly long. And Baroque rapiers tended to get even longer. And at some point the French said, this is stupid, and started making them smaller. <laughs>